What it do, flight crew? FTC. Flight team stand up! It may be May, but June is on the way. We got to try not to get scared. Six most disturbing, mysterious locations. These videos are purposely uploaded at nighttime. Hopefully you don't get jump scared. If you wet the bed, if you stream, I am not responsible. Chill is scared. Let's check it out. If you were to look at pretty much any map of the Gulf of Mexico drawn by Spanish explorers in the 16th and 17th centuries, you would find a small island lying off the north coast of the Yucatan Peninsula called Bermeja. Although the exact location of the island varied slightly depending on the map, it was a well-known really? fact what is that? a small island drawn by Spanish explorers in the 16th and 17th centuries, you would find a small island lying off the north coast of the Yucatan Peninsula called Bermeja. Although the exact location of the island varied slightly depending on the map, it was a well-known fact that the island at least existed. So, like, bro, I'm pretty good with the globe and stuff and knowing the earth. Bro, it, 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 I didn't even notice until today. Like, and speaking about that, I've always said, like, bro, there's so many, like, islands out there that haven't even been discovered. They talk about they've only discovered, what, 1% or 10% of the ocean, bro? I'm trying to tell y'all, bro, dinosaurs are still out there, dog. There are still all those things that you see in the movies, like dragons exist and all of that, bro. They're like, because you got to think about it at the end of the day. How do they just come up with that image of a dragon or something like that, bro? Somebody had to have seen it before. Bermeja was first mentioned by Spanish cartographer Alonso de Santa Cruz in an official list of islands in the Gulf of Mexico, published in Madrid in 1539. Alonso bro, de the year 1539 sounds crazy, bro. Imagine being, bro, no sports at the time, bro, no TV. Like, bro, what was it, bro? Ser no, I ain't gonna lie, this, we gotta have this conversation right this second. What seriously was humans doing back in the day? Anything below, like, 1920? Because, like, what, 1910, 1920, that's when, like, most of sports started to come alive and stuff? Like, bro, or TV and stuff? Like, what was people doing on a 24-hour basis? Like, taking walks all day? Like, I mean, people had pets, maybe, I think, but... There's like no type of fashion, music wasn't even around at the time. Like what was people doing all day, bro? Like was people just seriously like enjoying nature like just the entire day just being out in the sun or were, were they just like taking walks and hikes every like, what was people serious? I would bro. Yeah. Caves, another Spanish cartographer once wrote that from a distance Bermeja looked blondish or reddish, which is where the island's name came from. A couple of hundred years later in the mid-1800s, French-Mexican cartographers published reports stating that the island of Bermeja had started to sink. Mm. By the late 18th century, Bermeja was no longer featured in many maps of the area, and the last time it showed up on an official map was in the 1921 edition of the Geographic Atlas of the Mexican Republic. In the late 90s, the American and Mexican governments started negotiations to determine the boundaries for the exploitation rights of oil in the Gulf of Mexico. If the Mexican government could find the island of Bermeja, that would expand Mexico's oil drilling rights way further into the Gulf. Around that time, the Mexican government conducted three official investigations to find the island, armed with state-of-the-art ultrasound technology and all kinds of modern tools to locate it. Mysteriously, they couldn't find any trace of the island, and according to spokespeople from the Mexican Navy, it was as if the island had never even existed. A year after the Mexican Navy failed to find Bermeja, a Mexican senator named Jose Angel Sioncihelo, who was one of the most fierce advocates for the expansion of Mexico's oil drilling territory and the island's existence, was killed in a car accident on a Mexican highway when a semi-truck slammed into the right side of the car. His death quickly became the fuel for a conspiracy theory, according to which the CIA had blown up the island to further an oil-fueled American agenda. Of course, this theory is a bit of a stretch, and some of the other more logical theories that surfaced regarding the disappearance of the island are much more likely to be true. One possibility that researchers seem to favor is that the island sunk after an earthquake, or underwater landslide, which led to a further series of explorations in 2009 to see if the remains could be found at the bottom of the ocean. However, despite the even more advanced technologies that were used during that year's official investigations, the ultrasound exploration of the ocean floor revealed absolutely nothing but a sandy ocean bottom. Speculation that the island had never existed once again started circulating online and in the news, leading many people to adopt it as the truth. 
After the failed explorations in 2009, Julio Zamora, president of the Mexican Society of Geography, claimed that the existence of the island of Bermeja had probably been faked by early Spanish explorers to throw off other explorers and military rivals from other countries. This would make sense, as it was common practice to make slightly inaccurate maps back then for the sake of strategy. Another possible theory is that the island could have been drawn by one cartographer in the wrong location by mistake and replicated dozens of times over the centuries by other unaware cartographers. Still, some researchers think that due to the very precise descriptions of the island's physical appearance, Bermeja probably did exist but in another location. Despite the abundance of theories regarding the mysterious island's location and existence, 15 years after the last exploration of the last known location of Bermeja, the truth is still a mystery and will probably remain that way forever. Overton Bridge Built in 1895 in Dumbarton, Scotland, the Overton Bridge is a Gothic-style bridge overlooking a 50-foot ravine that leads up to Overton House, a 19th-century manor in the Scottish Lowlands. At first glance, Overton Bridge looks pretty much like any other bridge from the time, but there's one pretty dark detail that makes it different from any other structure in the area. For the past 80 years, hundreds of dogs have been jumping off the bridge and down to the ravine to their deaths for seemingly no apparent reason. What? Sometimes the dogs survive the fall and are left with debilitating injuries. And according to some reports, there have even been instances where dogs allegedly jumped off the bridge, survived, ran up the slope, and then jumped off once again to their deaths. Depending what? on the source, you'll find reports stating that the amount of dogs that have jumped off the bridge is either lower than 100 or in the high 100s. But regardless of the exact number, it's a fact that a lot of dogs have died at this bridge for some mysterious reason. That's creepy. As you can imagine, these incidents at Overton Bridge have fueled all kinds of outlandish theories, including suggestions that the bridge is haunted. According Nasty. to Celtic pagan beliefs, the bridge is located at a thin place, which is a place that lies at the supposed union between heaven and earth. Some locals have also favored more supernatural theories, with many people blaming the dog's death on the White Lady of Overton, the alleged ghost of the widow from Overton House. Another popular theory among the locals is that the dogs are being affected by negative residual energy from a tragic event that took place in 1994, in which a 32-year-old father threw his baby off the bridge, claiming that his child was the Antichrist. Bro, what? Where is that man at right now, man? Bruh! Yo, bro, people weird, dog. Following the tragic murder, the father was declared insane and locked up in a psych ward. But even with all the more outlandish theories that have gained traction in recent years, some researchers have come up with more plausible explanations for the mysterious incidents at Overton Bridge. In 2006, animal behaviorist David Sands investigated the bridge and suggested that the dogs are probably detecting the presence of wild animals below the bridge with their keen sense of smell, which makes them chase after the smell and inadvertently jump into their deaths. This would make sense, as according to official statistics in the area, minks began breeding in large numbers in the 50s in Scotland, and most long-nosed dogs seem to favor the smell of mink over any other small animal, including squirrels. From my research, most of the dogs that have died at the bridge are long-nosed breeds. Also, because the bridge has tapered edges, from the dog's point of view, the edge looks more like a flat plain, safe for running and chasing after small animals. So, while there will probably continue to be speculation about paranormal activity at Overton Bridge for many years to come, it's much more likely that the dogs aren't intentionally taking their lives and are simply falling to their deaths on accident while chasing the odors from other animals. Abandoned Viaduct Petrobras In the 1950s, the Brazilian government began a project to build BR-101, Brazil's longest highway spanning almost 3,000 miles. In the 1960s, construction began on a segment of highway called the Viaduct Petrobras that was meant to cross the Brazilian jungle to connect Rio de Janeiro and Santo São Paulo. Sixteen years after construction started, the segment of highway that crossed the jungle was due to be connected to an already existing part of the highway to finish the project. However, due to Brazil's economic crisis, plans changed at the very last minute, and instead of connecting the viaduct to the existing road, the highway was linked to a different coastal route. As a result, the viaduct Petrobras was left abandoned in the middle of the jungle, and wow. to this day, the Brazilian government has done nothing to remove it or reuse its parts. 
Standing over 130 feet tall and almost a thousand feet long, the structure features fully built tunnels, retaining walls, and a gigantic concrete foundation, which has slowly been swallowed by the jungle as the years have gone by. Mm. To an outsider, the viaduct Petrobras looks like it was taken out of the city and dropped in the middle of nowhere in the South American jungle for no reason, giving off an admittedly eerie atmosphere. Even though the viaduct Petrobras seems pretty wasteful, the out-of-place structure is now a pretty popular tourist destination for curious travelers and locals wanting to catch a glimpse of the abandoned concrete giant. Cola Super Deep Borehole in the 1960s, the Soviet Union and the U.S. were locked in a battle to develop superior space exploration technologies, often referred to as the space race. But what many people don't know is that the two countries were also competing to drill as close as possible to the center of the Earth. As is often the case, the motivation behind the drilling was mostly to find oil and valuable minerals. But from what I found, developing machines that can get close to the center of the Earth would also help understand the causes of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions at a much deeper level. In 1958, the U.S. government launched Project Mohal to collect a sample from Earth's mantle by drilling to the bottom of the ocean off Guadalupe Island in Mexico. Over the next eight years, they drilled over 600 feet into the seabed, but in 1966, the House of Representatives had to discontinue the project because it was getting too expensive. Four years later, in 1970, it was the Soviet Union's turn, and they drilled their hole close to the Barents Sea just outside the Norwegian border in a city known as Murmansk, Russia. At the time, the Soviet's goal was to drill as far down as possible, which researchers hoped would be a little over 9 miles. Unlike the US, the Soviets were a little more successful with their attempt and managed to drill way deeper into the Earth's crust, which resulted in the creation of the Kola Superdeep Borehole, also known as the world's deepest man-made hole. With a total depth of over 40,000 feet, or around 7.5 miles, the Kola Superdeep Borehole is deeper than the Mariana Trench, and its depth surpasses the height of Mount Everest. As the project progressed, the scientists realized the temperature was much higher than expected at every point below 10,000 feet, and at around 7.5 miles below the surface, the drill reported a temperature of almost 360 Fahrenheit. This was way higher than the 212 degrees Fahrenheit the scientists had predicted at that depth. So, even though the Soviets had broken a record with the Kola borehole, they too had to discontinue the project in 1992 due to increasing rock densities and crazy high temperatures. And in 2005, the drill was shut down and the hole was sealed for good. However, that wasn't the end of the story, and there's a slightly more disturbing reason why people remember the Kola Superdeep borehole. In the late 80s, a strange story started circulating in several Christian Finnish newspapers, which reported that a group of Soviet scientists had drilled a hole to the center of the earth and had allegedly lowered an extremely heat-tolerant microphone into the hole. Through this, they supposedly heard a series of extremely disturbing, tormented screams coming from the bottom of the well. Throughout the 90s, the story spread to other countries, until even American newspapers were running it. As the story gained popularity, sound files with the supposed audio of the tormented screams from the center of the earth started appearing everywhere online. I mean, didn't they teach us also in school, like science class at least, like the center of the earth is like the, the, the magma, like the core, like the, which is very hot? So, screams came from tormented souls stuck in hell. As it was later revealed, the original recording of tormented screams was made from a loop of various sound effects and the scary. soundtrack from the 90s. That's crazy how, like, you just, screams. this is like the footage of them drilling inside the earth as a whole? Like, it's just it straight up just bland. I would just think, I don't know why I would just think it would just be like, I don't know. It is, it's just super bland. Loop of various sound effects and the soundtrack from the 1972 movie Baron Blood. From this point forward, it was pretty much common knowledge that the screams were fake. However, it is a fact that some pretty disturbing sounds have been heard coming from the Kola Superdeep borehole, along with other Superdeep boreholes. In 2013, a Dutch artist Lute Given traveled to the 30,000 foot deep KTB Superdeep borehole in Germany, where she lowered a microphone protected by a thermal shield to see if she could pick up any sounds at the bottom of the well. Interestingly, a mysterious deep rumbling sound that scientists couldn't explain could be heard through the microphone, which in the artist's own words, some people thought sounded like hell, while others thought they could hear the planet breathe. Even though the sound is pretty cool to hear, even if a little haunting, the consensus among scientists is that the sound comes from layers and layers of rocks rearranging themselves after being moved around by the drill that made the hole. Mm. Potomsky Crater. Wait! One thing I've thought about too, like, yo, underneath the ocean, 
Because if you think about it, the ocean has to sit on some type of... Okay, so the reason why I thought about this is, you know, like how... Picture like a pool, right? A pool needs some type of ground for it to hold the water. You feel me? Like, what is, like, right there underneath the ocean? Is it just straight rock, or is it, like... That's why I'm just like... In 1949, a Russian geologist named Vadim Kolpakov stumbled upon a mysterious crater with a diameter of over 500 feet and a height of almost 140 feet in Irkutsk, Siberia. At the center of the crater, he found a little hill around 40 feet tall, which kind of looked like an eagle's nest with an egg inside it. Curious to find out what was inside the crater, Kopankov made plans to climb the mound and take a look inside to confirm his hypothesis that the crater had been caused by a meteorite. But the locals warned him that Fire Eagle Nest, as it's become known all over the world, allegedly possessed evil powers, and whoever stepped inside it would be dead soon after. Dismissing the insistent warnings as superstition, he climbed the mound, but failed to find any rock samples that supported his meteorite hypothesis. Over time, more and more expeditions were carried out to the crater, including one in 2005 in which the leader of the investigation died of a heart attack shortly after visiting the crater. Based on the findings of recent explorations, scientists have ruled out volcanic eruptions, nuclear explosions, and impact from a meteorite as possible causes for the crater. In the absence of a solid answer, some have started coming up with all kinds of theories to explain its origin, including the possibility that a UFO landing made the crater. Others have linked the crater to the Tunguska meteorite, the remains of which have never been discovered. One of the things that makes it so difficult to determine the origin of Fire Eagle Nest, or Kolpakov Cone as it's now popularly known, is that the crater frequently changes shape, which suggests that whatever caused it is still affecting it to this day. The only thing scientists know for sure is that the crater is around 250 years old, which they gathered from the rings on the trees growing on the mound. Strangely, it's been scientifically proven that the trees closer to the crater grow much faster than normal, which is similar to what happened in the forests around Chernobyl after the nuclear disaster. The lack of solid explanations, coupled with the weird tree phenomenon, has been fueled to the fire of outlandish conspiracy theories about underground nuclear plants and nuclear-powered UFOs buried beneath the crater. To this day, scientists still haven't determined what caused Kolpakov Cone to appear, and no asteroid fragments or metal parts have been found in the crater to support some of the theories people have come up with over the years. As of today, the most logical explanation is that the mound could have been caused by the underground release of hydrogen fluids and heat from a nearby gas volcano. This could have caused changes in the size of tree rings, which would explain why scientists thought they were growing at an abnormal rate. Still, despite the more convincing explanations that have surfaced over the years, the origin of Kolpakov Cone will probably remain a mystery for many years to come. Villa Epicune. Villa Epicune. In the 1920s, a small tourist village about 400 miles from Buenos Aires, Argentina, called Villa Epicune, was built along the shore of Lago Epicune, a salt lake touted for the health benefits and therapeutic effects of its mineral waters, which were said to be beneficial for rheumatic conditions. Quickly oh, turning cool. into a weekend getaway for Argentina's upper class, the town soon had a functional railroad station and a population of about 1,500 with a capacity to accommodate around 5,000 additional visitors at its peak in the 70s. Due to its popularity as a weekend getaway for Argentine city dwellers, a lot of money was poured into Villa Epicune to expand its accommodations and make it as comfortable as possible for visitors. However, it seemed not a lot of resources or attention was dedicated to the containment dam that separated the lake from the town. Unfortunately, on November 10th, 1985, the containment dam broke during a storm and a series of unusual strong winds. For two weeks, the water rose at a rate of half an inch per hour, until eventually the containment dam was completely destroyed by the water, after which all the locals had to abandon their homes and businesses and leave behind Villa Epicune. Over the following days, the flood drowned the town over 30 feet underwater, and it wasn't until 25 years later in 2009 that the waters began to recede and now show the eerie remains of the town, which now looks like something out of a dystopian movie. From above, you can see the original layout of the streets of Villa Epicune, along with its many businesses and the houses 1,500 people called home. With its overgrown trees, rusty post-apocalyptic appearance, and ghost town vibes, Villa Epicune now draws in tourists and photographers from all over the world who want to get a glimpse of the ruins of the once bustling getaway town. 
Due to the high levels of salt in the water that once flooded the town, most of the buildings in Villa Epicune are covered with a thin white residue, giving the town an even more creepy appearance. One of the more interesting facts about Villa Epicune is that even after it was completely destroyed by the water and flooded for more than 25 years, as soon as the water receded in 2009, one of the locals, then 81-year-old Pablo Novak, decided to come back home and live out the rest of his days in Villa Epicune. Out of the original 1,500 residents of the town, Pablo was the only one who came back. As the lone wow. inhabitant of Villa Epicune, Novak was officially named the cultural ambassador of the town in 2020. Wow. But unfortunately, in January 2024, Pablo Novak passed away at the age of 93, oh. leaving the town once again completely abandoned. Wow. Hey, Amen. Very chilling, six most disturbing, mysterious locations. Out of which one was the most disturbing one? I think my opinion that was the most disturbing one was a dog one. Like, I ain't not gonna lie, I've never heard some stuff like that before, though. That shit sounded crazy as hell. Like, they said oh, more than, like, it was around 100, but a little bit more than 100 that just jumped off that, like, bridge. That's weird as heck. That, that, that sounded very sus um, and everything like that. Uh, but let me know, man, what y'all think.